All right, moving into my favorite weapon category, personally, the Magnums. First, let's go over the ammo, Magnum rounds. Powerful bullets for the 357 Magnum revolver. All right, it's very specific because there really is only one weapon in this game that uses this ammo, and you see it in my equipped box. But yep, that's cool to realize behind that, the one round outside of the revolving chamber and stood up just like that. So there you go. Now let's go over the actual Magnum revolver. Ooh, looking really nice. It's loaded with Magnum rounds. Ah, yes, the retarded descriptions make a return. And I don't use that word lightly. I'm not afraid to use it. The situation calls for it. <laughs> but yeah, just look at that. Silver Serpent 357 Magnum. Let's see that animation again, but in this view. Woo! Okay, so I need to unload it to give you guys a proper description. Now that I have it unloaded, the gun fires 357 Magnum rounds. A powerful firearm, but it takes skill to handle it. <laughs> Much better description. And there's a reason they say it takes skill to handle it. Because you'll see a small difference depending on who wields it. But anyway, let's talk about things that can be compared to. First of all, here is it compared to its OG counterpart, the Colt Python, from the original Resident Evil game. But when it comes to the real life counterpart, it's no longer the standard Colt Python that it's based off of. It's a hybrid of both the Colt Python and the Colt Anaconda. So that being said, I can't compare it to any previous Colt Python we have seen. This is brand new in terms of the series. So the location of the Magnum Revolver is in the headstone area of the courtyard. This is the area with obviously the two headstones. Now, you need to have the wind crest on you in order to begin the process of getting the Magnum. So once you insert that crest, you get three other crests, and then you go to the other gravestone, and you have to insert them. And there's the Magnum Revolver, looking glorious. All right, and here's Jill having it equipped in game. Now what's interesting, I don't know if you've noticed it yet, but they shrink the weapons for Jill in size. You'll come to notice, especially with this one. When I switch over to Chris, you'll notice that it's much bigger and properly sized. And here are both characters' idle animations with the Magnum Revolver. Alright, let's go ahead and test this baby out. There's a reason I'm standing way over here, and this is the reason it mentions it takes skill to handle it. It pushes Jill back. I always love the reloads when it comes to Magnum Revolvers. Here's Chris holding the Magnum Revolver, and as I said, see the size difference? It's clearly much bigger when he's holding it. Let's have him test it out. And he has got the skill to handle it, as you'll see. He doesn't need to take a step back. And he also fires it slightly faster than Jill does. Okay, so we are going to test the Magnums on the Tyrant T002. So, it took five shots from the Magnum Revolver to take down the Tyrant. In this phase, anyway, you do come across him again at the very end of the game, but you can't defeat him with conventional weaponry. You can only defeat him in that phase with a rocket launcher, so that's why I use this phase specifically. Alrighty. Well, that's gonna conclude the Magnum Revolver for regular usage. However, if y'all remember, I've updated my Magnum tradition. Now it's gonna include all Magnums, and this is the first game since Resident Evil 2 where we have more than one Magnum, at least more than one variant of a Magnum. So, we are gonna do the traditional headshots with this Magnum. I will have Chris perform it with his precision and handling. Ugh, fail. Ugh. 
Headshot. Alrighty then. Well, that is gonna ultimately conclude the Magnum Revolver. Alright, now for the next quote-unquote Magnum. <laughs> the self-defense gun. A self-defense gun that fires 22 Magnum rounds. One round has been fired already. All right, so as you can see, this is an over-under pistol of sorts. And yes, it uses 22 Magnum rounds. That is why it is in the Magnum category. But as you can see, 22 Magnum double Dillinger. It's funny it calls it Dillinger here because the real-life weapon this is based off is the Chiapa Double Eagle Derringer. So they changed the vowel and two of the consonants just to make it different somehow. But yes, this is the real weapon it's based off of, which is also 22 Magnum. But 22 Winchester Magnum Rimfire is only as powerful as a 9mm cartridge in real life. All right, and of course, this is not featured in any previous game, including the original. Now, the location of the self-defense gun is in room 001 in the residence. Once you unlock this room, you come in here, you see a hanging body right here. You walk around it, and on this desk is the self-defense gun. This goes for both Chris and Jill. And right next to it is a suicide note. Here it is in game. <laughs> a freaking tiny thing, especially in Chris's hands. <laughs> you barely see anything. And here are both characters' idle animations with the self-defense gun equipped. Alright, so the thing about this weapon, as you saw, it only has one round loaded in it. That's because the other round was used on the person that committed suicide with it. And this is only meant to be used as a one-off, obviously. Its firepower is pretty insane, but of course, the drawback is it only has one shot. Now, as I mentioned earlier, near the beginning of this review, I am incorporating the use of a trainer. So, one of the things I can do is make this weapon infinite to where it doesn't run out of ammo. I am going to toggle that on for this so you can compare firing speed and so we can get a good test and compare it to the Magnum Revolver that we went over previously. So, let's go ahead and test it out. Normally it would only be one shot, but that's not going to be the case here. Just want to emphasize that muzzle flash. Look at the size of it. It is so large. There you go. And even though it has the same firing sound and animation as a regular handgun, there is no quick shotting this, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, now, I, of course, will test this on the Tyrant so we can compare it to the Magnum Revolver. Just remember, under normal circumstances, you would only be able to fire off one shot. So, it takes three shots from the self-defense gun to take down the Tyrant. Provided I'm using a trainer in order to accomplish that. Normally, you would fire it off that one shot if you really kept it around all this time. And then I would recommend maybe using the Magnum Revolver for the rest of it. But yep, that's it compared by raw firepower to the Magnum Revolver. Which is utterly ridiculous in realism because a 22 Magnum round is far weaker than a 357 Magnum round. Now, if you want my recommendation about this weapon... If you're gonna use it at all, I would use it fairly soon after acquiring it. I would say the Plant 42 boss or the Mother Neptune in the Aqua Ring, because apparently that one shot could defeat it without having to electrocute it. I think beyond that point, it's just a waste of space because you gather enough magnum ammo with the characters to sustain yourself against boss battles. So yeah, that would be my recommendation. Personally, I think it's a completely useless weapon. All right, that's gonna conclude the self-defense gun. Now for the last magnum of Resident Evil Remake. Barry's 44 Magnum. Fires 44 magnum rounds. An extremely powerful handgun. Not to mention one of Barry's favorites. Okay, so, at first glance, it looks exactly the same as the regular Magnum Revolver. But there are very tiny differences. The most obvious ones are the grip, and on the side, it's saying 44 Magnum instead of 357 Magnum. 
but one small difference as well, which I have to go back and forth between the two versions for you to even notice. The barrel is slightly larger on Barry's Magnum. But otherwise, this is exactly the same base weapon as the Magnum Revolver. This is based off of a Colt Python, Colt Anaconda hybrid. In real life, this weapon can use either 357 or 44 Magnum rounds. You can just say the Magnum Revolver is the 357 variant, while Barry's Magnum is the 44 Magnum variant. Now, in order to get Barry's Magnum, you have to make the fateful decision to decline giving him back his Magnum during this cutscene. This, however, results in the non-canon death of him, so it's a trade-off. For a very powerful weapon, you have to kill off a very lovable character. Regardless that he's currently working under Wesker at this point. Once that occurs, you can pick it up. So now that you know where it comes from, obviously it doesn't come with its own ammunition, since the only magnum ammo the game provides is 357. So you have these six shots, and that is it. So you gotta use it sparingly. So here's Jill with it. I will mention that you can use it with Chris if you have the trainer, which I do. But here's the thing. I actually looked into this very closely. When you're in the inventory, yes, there is an obvious difference. It says 44 on the side instead of 357. However, for some reason, it doesn't say 44 when you're holding it in game like this. So they don't swap the model out. It's only for the inventory. That being said, I'm not even going to bother showing it with Chris because it's actually the same exact model as the 357 variant. Just wanted to get that out of the way. So here we go. Let's go ahead and test it out. Alrighty. So, because Jill's the only one could use it, we'll go ahead and test this on the Tyrant as well to compare to the other two Magnum class weapons we've gone over so far. Wow. So, against the Tyrant, Barry's Magnum only took one shot. This thing is super powerful, at least against the Tyrant. Now, I'm gonna be honest with y'all, that kind of surprised me because in off-camera tests, I tested all three Magnums on Hunters, and for some reason, the self-defense gun was stronger than Barry's Magnum in that case. I don't know how that's possible. I think Barry's Magnum has some flavor effect towards the Tyrant specifically. I think that's what's going on here, which makes sense because you don't get this until very late in the game, and the Tyrant really is one of the only enemies that would be sensible to test this on. So they probably did that on purpose, if you think about it. But that was awesome to test on, just to show you guys that that's probably the enemy that this weapon is meant for, if you're really going to kill Barry to get it. So yeah. Alrighty then, so that's going to conclude regular usage of Barry's Magnum. Now, of course, I'm going to do the explosive headshot with this as well. This is the official strongest Magnum, I guess in that sense, capable of critical headshots anyway. So yeah, we're going to do that, and Jill is going to have the honor to do it with. And yes, if you're curious, the self-defense gun isn't capable of criticals, so that's why I didn't even bother with that gun when it came to the critical headshot. Alright, let's go. Headshot. That one was epic, especially in that glorious slow-mo with the higher frame rate. I'm sure you guys just creamed your pants. Alrighty. <laughs> that is going to ultimately conclude Barry's 44 Magnum, as well as all Magnums. Awesome sauce. from him, Jill! He's insane! Barry. I like the buddy system we have here. Wesker! Thank you, Barry. Damn it! We're almost there!
Now for the one and only miscellaneous weapon. And this one's going to segue perfectly into the explosives following it. Don't mind the infinite rocket launcher right here. I will get to that eventually. So for now, here is the flamethrower. An anti-personnel weapon that sprays a stream of flames. All right, it's a fairly brief description, but I like it. So here it is compared to its OG counterpart, a clear difference, because this one has two canisters, one for the fuel and one for the fire. I believe that's what they're both for. So this weapon can only be used by Chris Redfield. You do not get this at all in Jill's scenario. However, if you use the trainer like I am for this weapon showcase, you can technically put it in her inventory, but if you try to equip it with her, all that happens is she's still unequipped with no weapon, and the quantity suddenly disappears after going back into the inventory. So, you can try, but you just cannot use this with Jill Valentine. Just like the original game, the location of the flamethrower is in the basement level of the courtyard, specifically in the passage with a trap. This is the first boulder passage where you have to avoid a boulder in order to proceed and as you can see here it's right at the entrance on this panel with two hooks so once you take it with Chris this activates and you can't go back through the door in this case the weapon is more used as a key item rather than a weapon but it is still usable as a weapon you need it for another panel with hooks in order to proceed through a locked door and that being said you cannot bring it out of the basement courtyard all right here's Chris holding it and here's a idle stance. And let's go ahead and test it out. It goes out really fast if you just hold it down like that. <laughs> Not surprising really, that's how they've always been so far in the series. So, I'm actually gonna test this, just like the original, on a hunter. Cause there is one down here that I could test the flamethrower on. That last pull of the trigger, he was already in dying animation, so I'm nullifying that one. So it took five bursts from the flamethrower to defeat the hunter. Not bad. It's hard to tell like how much percentage a single pull of the trigger is going to use, but did start at 100%. Now I'm down to 54%. Actually, here, I could test it right here. So we're at 54 right now. I'm going to just tap the trigger. Wow, okay, so it takes like 8% per trigger pull. So even in short bursts like that, it's not nearly as efficient as its original counterpart, unfortunately. So you still gotta be careful with it, obviously. So it makes sense, five trigger pulls, about 8% roughly. So yeah, a little more than 40% it did use ultimately. That checks out. Alrighty then. Well, that's gonna conclude the flamethrower, the one and only miscellaneous weapon. Okay, I think it's worth showing y'all just something funny we discovered. So I'm using the trainer right now, and I have the flamethrower at a part of the game that you couldn't hope to have it. Check this out. It causes no damage whatsoever to regular zombies. I don't understand why the devs couldn't still add a damage factor because they had trainers when they developed the game. So I don't know why they overlooked this or just decided to completely ignore it. But yeah, it's hilarious. You cannot go through this game with just a flamethrower if you ever planned on it using the trainer anyway. So I just wanted to point that hilarious fact out. <laughs> All right, moving into the final category of the game, the explosive weapons. We're gonna start with the grenade launcher, the well-known multi-rounded weapon. Let's go over all of its ammo types. First, you got regular grenade shells with the gray cap. Shells for the grenade launcher. They are filled with high explosives. Okay, the description sort of in a way is calling back to RE3 Nemesis with its types. Let's see what the other ones are. Acid rounds or acid shells. Shells for the grenade launcher. They are filled with sulfuric acid. Okay, not nearly as technical, but still, there is a differentiating factor. 
And finally, incendiary rounds, or shells. They are filled with special fuel that ignites upon impact with target. <laughs> all right, so there's all the different rounds, and now let's go over the grenade launcher itself. Grenades are already loaded. Ah, another lazy ass description that requires me to unload the weapon to get a proper one out of. Here's the proper description. A gun that fires grenade rounds, acid rounds, or incendiary rounds. <laughs> so it still doesn't really have a description. It just tells you all the different rounds it could fire once you unload it. <laughs> Alrighty then, get a close up of it. I don't think it matters what rounds are loaded. It's gonna look like that on the inside. So, here it is compared to its original counterpart, what was known as the grenade gun, or bazooka. Now, this, when it comes to real life, kind of similar to the Magnum Revolver, is actually now a hybrid of two different weapons entirely. It does feature parts of the Arwen 37 that the original bazooka was based off of, but now it also incorporates some parts of a Colt M4A1 carbine, specifically the stock, that's one of the obvious parts, and the foregrip, and probably the railing that you see in the center of the gun. Now, of course, this is a Jill-only weapon. If you tried to use this with Chris, he wouldn't have anything in his hand. It's just not usable. Now, just like the original game, the location of the grenade launcher is on the East Terrace on the second floor of the mansion. Now, if you're playing New Game Plus and have already unlocked one dangerous zombie, you'll just find it here willy-nilly, like so. However, if you're playing for the first time, there'll be a little cutscene with the body of Star's team member, Forrest Spare. Or if you took a specific path where you haven't met Barry up until this point, you'll find Barry out here and he'll just hand you the weapon. But in any case, this is where the weapon is located. And if you play as Chris, nothing will be here at all. So first we'll load it with regular grenade rounds. There is no reload animation for it still, unfortunately. So let's go ahead and test it out. And of course being grenade launcher, I'll face towards a wall so you can see the explosion. All right, now, this is one of the only other weapons that can fire faster. The trick with this one is you have to release the aiming button and then immediately get back into aiming and the fire rate will actually be faster. Check this out. A lot faster. Now let's check out acid rounds. Actually, leaving a pool of acid, that's interesting. Probably the most realistic acid rounds we've seen all series. All right, and finally, incendiary shells. that beautiful fire. Alrighty, nice explosive power between all of those different rounds. Now, I am going to revert back to the Hunter for this weapons test, and we're going to test all three rounds on it, see how much of a difference there is. So between the five hunters, three of them took only two explosive rounds, while these other two in this room took three each. 
So there is minor variance, it seems, at least between the hunters. I'm glad there was some difference there. It wasn't like the shotguns where it was the same all across the board. But yeah, pretty nice. All right, let's switch over to acid rounds and conduct the same tests. Oh yeah, I should also mention that unlike the original, you do not have to empty it first. So that's really nice. That's a quality of life improvement right there. Yeah! So with acid rounds, all but one hunter took only one. With that last hunter, I deliberately waited for an animation so I can get behind it. And it's the only one that took more than one. So it's either that when you just hit them point blank in the face like that with acid rounds, it's probably going to take one across the board. And when you go for the back, maybe it will take less. Or that hunter truly is maybe just a tiny bit stronger than all the rest of them, just through variability and whatnot. But either way, I'm glad there was a tiny bit of variance. Clearly, acid rounds are stronger than explosive rounds. That much is a fact from that test alone. All right, now let's finally test out incendiary rounds. So when it comes to the incendiary rounds, we had the most variance with the shot amounts. On average, it takes two to three shots, clearly, with the incendiary rounds. Considering there were more threes than the explosive rounds, I'm going to go on a whim and say the incendiary rounds are the weakest when it comes to hunters. Not real surprising there. And the acid rounds are the strongest. Now, as always, when it comes to the individual rounds, there are some enemies that are more suited for them. Combining my personal experience with the accounts of past commenters on my now obsolete showcase, explosive shells are the most average round across the board in terms of damage. There's no enemy it's particularly weak against necessarily, but it is emphasized that they're strong against chimeras. Apparently they go down in one shot, and I think most of the weaker enemies probably go down in one, maybe two shots, like zombies and Cerberi. Now, acid shells are really powerful against living things like B.O.W.s, such as Hunters, the Tyrant, and the Yawn. However, it sucks, apparently, against the Chimeras, which is funny because I just said the Explosive are strong against Chimeras. And apparently, it also sucks against Zombies and Crimson Heads. So, what the Explosive is strong for, the Acid is weak, and vice versa for both rounds, I would suppose incendiary are fine-tuned for plants and spiders so spiders or what are called web spinners in this game specifically and the plant 42 boss are very susceptible to incendiary rounds and something to mention is they are capable of burning regular zombies and preventing them from becoming crimson heads so there's an extra use case for the incendiary rounds right there those are my best recommendations for each individual type of round Alrighty, people, that is gonna finally conclude the Grenade Launcher. Time to go over some kings. Here's the Rocket Launcher, the regular one. A very familiar looking one, of course. A very destructive weapon that fires rockets with a large blast radius. <laughs> Alrighty then. So, yep, we've seen this rocket launcher a few times now, starting with its OG counterpart in Resident Evil 1. And then we did see it again in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, as well as Resident Evil Gaiden. And as always, this is based on the M202 Flash. So the rocket launcher is a weapon that you can only acquire at the very end of the game, just like the original. While battling the tyrant, you have to damage enough or survive long enough in order for Brad to drop it out of the helicopter. Chris, use it! Kill it, whatever it is! Now, under normal circumstances, you would only be able to use this at the very end of the game. But of course, I'm going to incorporate the use of the trainer, and I'm going to look this over in our hub right here. So check it, get a nice close-up of it. Don't have to worry about the tyrant interrupting us like in the previous reviews. 
Yeah, looking really nice. Now, what's really funny is when Jill is handling it, she's hunched backward a little bit, probably because it weighs a lot. So yeah, there you go. There is no idle animation with this, so let's go ahead and test it out. She, of course, has to take a step back. And there is no aiming up or down. Of course, I could fire more if I turn on infinite ammo, but you don't need to see any more than that, really. <laughs> so, of course, we will test this on the only enemy it's made to be tested on, the final tyrant boss fight. All right, that is the one and only way to use the rocket launcher. And yes, as you can see, it can deflect one of the rockets at least. So don't miss with the other three, otherwise you're screwed. <laughs> All right, that's gonna conclude the regular rocket launcher. All right, we've reached the end. Here's the final weapon of the game. Also a rocket launcher. I like to call this one the infinite rocket launcher because that's what it is. Launches fire and forget rockets continuously. Extremely destructive. <laughs> Alrighty then. And yeah, this is quite an abomination of a weapon, just by the looks of it. So here's some weapons that the website does mention. Among the bits visible are an Accuracy International AW50-esque stock, a trigger guard from an M1 Garand or an M14, an unusable folding bipod, and an oversized version of a ZMLR300's handguard. So yeah, like I said, an abomination of a weapon. Of course, this was not previously seen in any other Resident Evil, including the OG, so there you go. The infinite rocket launcher is an unlockable by beating the game under three hours, in normal mode or higher. All right, and Chris will be the presenter of this. Here he is holding it in game. There is no idle animation with this one, so let's get straight to the testing. Poof, it's power. Even Chris can't handle it. <laughs> he has to block his face when aiming down. What's interesting is while Chris has to cover his face when aiming downward, Jill doesn't have to. It's still very funny. This is a very clear example. It's so much smaller when she's handling it. So you can actually break the animation if you try to move during the firing sequence and fire it fast. Check this out. That's awesome. All right, well, this being an infinite rock launcher unlockable, we're gonna do our usual rocket launcher tradition. We are gonna cheese every enemy in the game with this thing. So enjoy the explosive slideshow.
Huh, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is gonna conclude my ultimate weapon showcase of Resident Evil Remake. Really hope you enjoyed the video. Very fun to make. Even though this is the fourth time I'm covering this game's weapons, it doesn't change the fun level for me personally. And it was really nice to get to one of the main games again after two straight spinoffs that were just mediocre. So yeah, a nice return to form here. So, now's the time to add the total amount of weapons in this game to the overall total count that we have in this series thus far. So we left off at 77 from Gaiden, and this game has a total of 16 individual weapons. So let's add them up. We are at 93 weapons now. Getting close to the hundreds, the next game coming up is going to cross that threshold, so look forward to it. The next game, of course, is Resident Evil Zero, the ultimate prequel game. All right, guys, this is Shankster94, aka The Gamer Shankster. Slap a like on the video, share it with your friends, leave a comment on it, and don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell and select all so you always receive notifications right when I upload a new video. Don't forget to follow me on social media, starting with X Twitter at Shankster underscore 94. Check out my Facebook page. And of course, support me financially if you wish on Patreon. Shout out to Ophirgo the Fearless for being my current active patron as of this moment. And don't forget to join my Discord server if you haven't already. Great opportunity for you guys to communicate with me personally and catch me when I'm making these videos because one of my favorite things to do these days is to stream the production process when it comes to recording. And my closest friends who join me on all these always are there to have my back in case I miss a step here and there. <laughs> and even though it can sometimes irk me in the moment, I never regret it. So yeah, if you want to see these productions live, join my Discord server if you haven't already. And if you do join my Discord server, don't forget to read the instructions, because there's been a few people in the past now who join the server, but never gain full access because they don't pay attention, because it's a private server. I don't just let anyone join willy-nilly. You gotta read some rules. So yeah, don't forget to do that. Alright, peace out. I'll see you guys in the Ultimate Weapon Showcase of Resident Evil Zero.